Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is John Hamry. I welcome you to this. This is a very exciting program we'll have today and so grateful to have such senior and distinguished participants in this call. Uh, Secretary Granholm, thank you for joining us. We're so grateful to have you. Um, CSIS started this project about two years ago. We called Just Transitions to a Global Clean Energy Future. You know, in this revolution that's underway, uh, some communities and some people's jobs are going to be vulnerable going forward. And we owe them an opportunity to make a transition so that they have just as bright and brilliant a future as we will. Uh, that's the purpose of our conversation today. I We have such short time. I'm going to do, turn now to Nikos. Nikos, would you, would you please get us started? But thanks to all of our remarkable speakers. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Hamry, uh, for that introduction. Um, as Dr. Hamry said, the concept of a just transition is something that we at CSIS have been at for a while now. We have a project launched by my colleague and predecessor, Sarah Ladislaw, with the Climate Investment Funds. One of the things I've learned in this conversation is uh, it's a topic that means different things to different people. Uh, when you have a conversation where I grew up in Greece, it's a little bit different than the conversation you may have in Washington or Alaska or South Africa or India, but it's a conversation with a common denominator and that's the search for fairness uh, amidst change. Uh, and also the sense that we want change to be for the better and to be fair. And so I think that is what makes it quite universal no matter where you are, uh, quite human. Uh, and so I'm very excited that we're able to assemble this incredible panel of people from all over the world to talk about this. We are joined by uh, the Secretary for the Department of Energy, Jennifer Granholm. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Secretary. Uh, Minister Seamus Reagan, uh, Minister of Natural Resources of Canada. Commissioner Kadri Simpson from the European Commission. Uh, Minister Damantra Pradhan, Minister of Oil and Natural Gas and Minister of Steel from the Government of India. Uh, Secretary Treasurer Liz Schuler from the FLCIO and Ms. Wajira Mathai from the World Resources Institute, where she is a Vice President and Regional Director for Africa. Uh, Secretary Granholm, let me begin with you. We are having this event in part because the President has called the leaders of the world to a climate summit. So we have seen the President of this administration make energy and climate a top priority. You yourself have talked about the opportunity in the clean energy transition for jobs, for investment, for addressing past injustices, for capturing and creating new markets. Tell us what are the administration's priorities in this space and its plans to create a just transition? Thanks, uh, Nikos, and thanks to these incredible fellow panelists. It's great to be with all of you who like me, understand that these workers who've been essential to our respective nations' economic growth still have so much to offer during the clean energy transition. So to answer your question, this administration's approach can be uh, summed up by President Biden's three favorite words, which is we're gonna build back better. And that means doing everything that we possibly can do to make sure that this transition creates new jobs and clean energy solutions and economic opportunities for every community so they can lead the world, those communities can help lead uh, as the global economy rapidly moves to decarbonize. And that especially includes the coal and the fossil energy communities that have literally helped to build America and many of our countries over the last century. I, I was uh, listening and to paraphrase uh, Senator Joe Manchin yesterday who represents mine workers in coal country. He said, if given the chance, these workers could build the best damn wind turbine you'd ever see. And so in his first week in office, President Biden signed an executive order which tasked my department, the Department of Energy to staff a whole of government process to figure out how to do right by these communities. 
And I certainly know from my time, I was the governor of the state of Michigan before um, being energy secretary. And I know that the most transformative solutions are the ones that are grounded in community. And our approach here is, is similarly inclusive. We're giving these communities a seat at the table. And we're not only asking for their input, but for their help to create the solutions that are going to work best for them. And you can see that in President Biden's American Jobs Plan, which is a, <laughs> an amazing commitment, the biggest commitment in us, in, in our country since World War II. And it proposes billions of dollars for place-based strategies to scale up industries of the future that fossil workers can get jobs in. For example, the American Jobs Plan would launch 15 decarbonized hydrogen demonstrations. Those are big demonstrations with lots of jobs specifically targeted in distressed communities. It would also launch 10 pioneer carbon capture retrofits in steel and cement and chemical plants, as well as power plants, leading the way for industrial facilities to operate with lower or no carbon emissions. We want to be able to have miners mine for geothermal. We want to be able to give people a chance to see their future in this clean energy economy. So we're just getting started. I'm very excited to collaborate with my fellow panelists and nations around the world as we navigate this transition together and learn from each other. We have so many different fora forums to work through. But in particular, I just have to say, I'm happy today to announce that the US is going to be uh, joining the Empowering People Initiative, which will be launched at the 12th Clean Energy Ministerial in June. So I'd like to thank my colleagues from Canada and the EU for initiating that important effort. I cannot wait to get to work alongside them. Thank you, Secretary Granable, for, for your comments and for your leadership on this issue. Uh, I wanted to turn to you, um, uh, Minister Oregon. Uh, Canada has made a commitment to phase out coal from power generation by 2030. You had a process for a just transition for coal workers and communities. Can you talk to us about where you are in that process and also what are your priorities going forward? There we are. How are you? Good. Hello to all of you. Now. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, and that's, I find that very important, uh, kind of crucial to getting your message across. Unmuting. I am in the uh, island of Newfoundland, which is one of Canada's three oil producing provinces. And um, our just transition, as, as Secretary Granholm said, we echo her. Our, it's all about workers. Our entire climate plan is about lowering emissions driving economic growth and supporting workers in this transition. We, we were here in this province, my province, we rely on oil revenues more than any other Canadian province. So, uh, you know, these are, these are my friends and neighbors. So I have to get this right. You know, these, these workers are, are the people I live with. And I, we won't be able to transition to a low carbon economy without putting them first, because who do we think is going to drive down these emissions and build up renewables? It's, Oil and gas workers, as you know, Bill Gates said just a few weeks ago, it's oil and gas workers who understand the complex engineering involved. And the transition that we have talked about now for many years is happening. I mean, the markets are moving. This is real. And workers know this. You know, as one of them told me, you know, Seamus, you know, we're used to retooling. We just want to know what we're retooling to. Another union uh, leader, head of the, the crane operators union said to me, you know, whether we're, a job is a job, whether we're lifting an oil pipeline or a wind turbine, we just want good work. Um, we know where the puck is going. That's our, our saying here in Canada. I, I know the secretary says it as well. It's from Walter Gretzky, the father of one of our great ice hockey players here in Canada. And he always says, skate to where the puck is going. We know where the puck is going. So we made the decision to phase out coal and workers were our focus. Our task force underscored the importance of connecting directly with and investing in affected workers in their communities. And look, the situation's unique in each region of our country. We're a big country. There are a lot of regions. Four out of 10 provinces were affected by this phase out. So we created policies and programs that were flexible enough to address the unique circumstances right down to the community level. We've been working with communities in each of the four provinces affected by this phase out to address their specific needs. 
we already had federal organizations called regional development agencies in place and those agencies were locally based locally staffed so we worked through them and they have been critical to the success of our measures and each of the communities that we've worked with on this plan has been clear diversification is the key to sustainable economic growth they're happy to retool they just need to know what they're retooling to and they need support to do it. So we responded with two programs to phase out coal-fired electricity by 2030, and we're actually ahead of schedule. The first was the Canada Coal Transition Initiative, which is currently supporting 44 economic diversification projects across our provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta in the east, or west, I'm sorry, and New Brunswick and Nova Scotia in the east. And the second was the infrastructure fund, which supports infrastructure projects in, in impacted communities. And those projects are, are getting underway now. And we're still doing more. Uh, we're working with the Atlantic provinces out here on transmission interties that will connect regions with surplus non-emitting power to regions that are moving away from coal. We call it the Atlantic Loop. And my home province here of Newfoundland and Labrador could be a big supplier of that non-emitting power. This will reduce GHGs, improve the resiliency of the grid, provide non-emitting, affordable power, and create jobs. And it's, it's these kind of investments that I think are going to put us past our, our Paris 2030 targets and to net zero by 2050. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, let me turn to you, uh, Commissioner Simpson. From the beginning, the European Green Deal has been uh, has put just transition as one of its core elements. Uh, we have seen a number of initiatives. We have seen support and emphasis on the coal regions of the European Union. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about where we are in this process, what we have learned from these past few years, this engagement with governments, with local communities, with other stakeholders, NGOs? Uh, can you give us a sense of where we are and what we have learned from that process? Good afternoon from uh, sunny Brussels. And indeed, our Green Deal uh, puts our people in, in the center of our policies. And uh, even in the uh, situation where we, uh, we, well, we are committed to become the first climate neutral content by 2050. And, and uh, as you know, net zero is our response to the global climate emergency, but it is also our growth strategy. So um, for us, the Green Deal economy means that uh, we will evolve towards cleaner industries, um, more sustainable business models and, uh, and new job opportunities. So we estimate that the Green Deal can generate up to 1.2 million new jobs um, all over the, uh, Europe uh, within the next decade alone, and up to 2.1 million jobs uh, by 2050. And in comparison, right now uh, in Europe, there are currently uh, approximately 200,000 jobs in the uh, hard coal sector. So um, that said, um, of course, we have to admit that uh, every modernization process comes with um, disruption and dislocation. Uh, and previous experience suggests that uh, without targeted action, the phase out of coal will bring um, long term unemployment and uh, decades of um, depopulation in uh, coal regions. So. Um, we know that naturally investments uh, will flow to richer and better equipped areas, so we have to do something. And with the Green Deal, we committed to, to a different future for those regions. So uh, true climate leadership means that um, the transition has to be uh, fair and just, and we need to design policies that address the consequences of the transition and uh, help those uh, that do live in most vulnerable regions. So you asked about the progress we have made uh, so far and the lessons we have learned. Uh, so indeed, um, uh, first to ensure that uh, no one is left behind, uh, we must uh, involve vulnerable com communities in the planning and implementation of the transition. And uh, when we launched the EU initiative for coal regions in transition in already 2017, we brought all stakeholders, so national governments, businesses, trade unions, and NGOs together to start a transparent, open discussion on the transition. And, uh, and we also uh, established uh, a necessary local governance mechanism. So we will do all those uh, necessary actions together. Uh, for example, we set up a governance structure to coordinate efforts of different municipalities in Q Valley in Romania, 
We helped Slovenia uh, to launch its own coal commission based on the German model um, to adopt a phase out date for coal um, because the end date is important. And, and uh, for example, we also supported uh, Asturias in Spain uh, and the Midlands in Ireland uh, in conducting wide reaching local consultations for the regional transition strategies. So, secondly, uh, we must uh, provide uh, public support to clean energy and uh, just transition projects. Uh, the Commission, um, the European Commission, created a just transition mechanism uh, aimed to mobilize up to 100 billion euros by 2030 to support clean energy and just transition projects in coal and carbon intensive regions. And this targeted instrument uh, will, will also complement the Europe's um, greenest budget in the history. So, uh, this budget, coupled with a recovery fund, to deal with the effect of, uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic is worth of 1.8 trillion euros uh, for the coming seven years. And at least 30% of it will go to green transition and will, will be complemented by structural reforms to, to prepare our economies um, and our workforce for the future. And, uh, and beyond these public fund, funds, uh, we are bringing technical support to the regions. And thirdly, uh, of course, we must create uh, the necessary conditions and supportive environment to make um, new investment possible. And this means um, training workers, also repurposing land and uh, diversifying the local economy um, with basically with the sectors of the future uh, in mind. And, uh, and jobs that we know are bound to be lost in carbon intensive energy and industry, uh, these used to be well paid and they came with the benefits uh, in the past. Um, and uh, and uh, they also came with a sense of job security and career prospects. And now people that will lose these jobs need to be convinced of the benefits of the transition and seeing new, uh, well-paid, interesting employment opportunities um, is a key aspect uh, of that. And uh, that we try to uh, organize and uh, secure in those um, um, in those most uh, uh, um, uh, vulnerable regions across Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. As someone who grew up in, in Greece, I've, I've seen just how the conversation around just transition has really shaped uh, how the country talks about the coal phase out and the opportunities created by the energy transition. So I wanted to thank you, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to turn to you, uh, Mr. Pradhan, obviously, India is in a different position. It's a developing economy with growing energy needs. I wanted to ask you, what does the clean energy future look like from, from your perspective? And what are the opportunities and priorities of the government of India in this regard? Sorry. Thank you, CSIS, for organizing this uh, wonderful introduction of this uh, distinguished panelist on the sideline of the Global Leaders Summit uh, to be held tomorrow. You have rightly mentioned India's case. Uh, in the introduction, you also mentioned we are emerging economy. We are our priority, our uh, strategy is something different from the other part of the globe or de uh, developed economy group. With that also, we're totally committed what we have placed in front of the global citizenship in, citizens in the 2015 to decarbonize our economy as a responsible global citizen, as a country, we're committed to that uh, commitment. Today, our energy appetite is increasing Today we are one, on the, one among the uh, number three energy consumer of the global standards. Our energy per capita energy consumption is one third of the global average. That means in future our energy demand will increase. All the experts of the globe are predicting on one unanimous on one thing: the future of the growth of energy demand will come from India. In, here lies our answer. Now we are planning the incremental requirement of our energy will come from the renewable energy. Recently, Prime Minister Modi very categorically announced the next uh, 
2030 in our energy basket 40% will come from the renewable sector lot of emphasis you are giving on the solar energy wind energy biofuels biogases and recently not only the renewable energy basket we are also looking towards future energy new technology based energy hydrogen is a priority area for us in the recent budget in february prime minister given emphasis to create a hydrogen mission to a more r and d more uh, business plan more uh, pilot projects in that way we will embrace the new energy technology new energy vertical also in that way we are committed on certain things gradually we will phase out our existing energy consumption pattern we will transit more towards a greener, greener and cleaner path but looking into our affordability challenges looking into our price sensitivity in our domestic economy we are using gas as a bridge fuel though gas is part of fossil fuel family but we count gas is a cleaner energy than oil and coal oil and coal will continue to be our in our energy basket for a period but gradually we are making them more cleaner we will put gas as a transition fuel as a bridge fuel and gradually we are moving towards more cleaner renewable energy and it will go up to hydrogen energy this is our road map thank you so much uh, minister for these comments uh, and really appreciate uh, the commitment of the government of india uh, to changing the energy basket while of course recognizing the the different starting point of india i think that's a very important thing for us to always remember um uh, let me turn to uh, you secretary treasury shuler and, and we really appreciate to having you on this panel to bring the perspective of labor and workers um i wanted to ask you what does the just transition mean to you and and, and maybe as you answer that uh, you know we have a lot of clean energy jobs in the united states you know what are we doing right what are the success that we're seeing so far either in terms of regions or trades and what are the challenges that you see that we have to do a little bit better sure um well thank you good morning um good afternoon good evening <laughs> since this is global um thanks for the question thanks for including us nikos and uh thank you to uh CSIS for bringing us all together uh i will say it's an honor to be here with this distinguished panel especially our secretary um secretary granholm uh, and the other ministers i love what i'm hearing this morning so far i've been nodding my head the whole time um just for context the AFL CIO is an umbrella organization of um 56 unions 12 and a half million working people were diverse were inclusive were across all sectors of the economy um and very much in the energy industry uh so i applaud you for this conversation on just transition and for workers you know that can mean many things um and it could mean uh supports for workers in industries that are declining and you know thinking about things like wage replacement for those who are displaced and you know a bridge to pension and job training programs uh but i'd like to highlight two other things i i think we should be thinking about for an equitable clean energy future and the first is to make sure that no community is left behind and what we like to talk about uh place based strategies and that means creating the jobs and the opportunities within communities that are impacted by the clean energy transition and within communities that are have been you know impacted by environmental degradation um and so that means identifying local job creating investments before existing jobs are lost and you know earlier this week one of our affiliated unions the mine workers union made that point and they released um uh, a transition plan from their perspective uh and one of their members said um and he's a mid career miner in west virginia 
And he said, yeah, I get it. No one wants to see the planet get ruined. And if I have to pivot into a new industry, then I will, but it can't just all be on me. And he would move into a clean energy job right now if it kept him home and he had the support to get there. And to do that in coal and other fossil fuel communities, the Biden administration's American Jobs Plan really shows us the way. Uh, it includes targeted investments to create good jobs in new industries. Um, it also has an immediate upfront investment that will put a quarter of a million people to work in union jobs, many of those in rural America, cleaning up existing oil and gas wells and abandoned mines. And Secretary Granholm and the Department of Energy, I think she mentioned, is leading uh, President Biden's interagency working group on coal communities. What an important signal that sends, right? Because it is absolutely critical for working families to know that doing the right thing to fight climate change doesn't come at the cost of their jobs and their quality of life. That's what we're up against. And quickly, um, my second point, job quality. The transition should not mean a transition from existing high quality energy jobs to low paying jobs, right? And as you said, there are thousands and thousands of jobs in clean energy, hundreds of thousands, right? But those jobs aren't necessarily good jobs with family supporting wages and benefits and retirement security as it stands today. Because right now, renewable energy jobs pay a fraction of what existing energy jobs pay. And we need to grow this industry with a high road, high wage strategy. And we need to remove the barriers to workers organizing in unions <laughs> and restore bargaining rights because that's how we actually raise the standards and make sure that clean energy jobs are good jobs. Um, and we can get there. And Nikos, you asked about what's working. Um, we are looking at offshore wind right now as, as a model because workers in the building trades unions, uh, they built the first successful offshore wind farm in the United States. And we did that with a top-down partnership with the developers. And we decided together that we were gonna work collaboratively to create that high road strategy. So that's something that I think is a success we can point to. And Secretary Granholm talks about this all the time, that good union jobs are gonna be critical for reaching the administration's bold new goal of, of powering millions of American homes with offshore wind energy by 2030. So we, we see untapped potential in the massive investments in clean energy, in research and development, you know, whether it be carbon capture, electric vehicles, semiconductors, large batteries. But the key is that we turn the publicly funded research and all these investments into the jobs that are gonna benefit workers throughout the supply chain also, um, so that manufacturing can actually grow again as we innovate. And we have to include a worker voice in the process all along the way. Thank you. Thank you so much for these comments and also for mentioning offshore wind. We put out a commentary a couple of weeks ago here at CSI is talking about that. Obviously, the administration's bold plans, but also a lot of what's happening at the state level and the emphasis on sort of ensuring that value chain and port infrastructure investments and worker retraining. There's enormous opportunity, not just for the energy that comes out of the offshore wind industry, but also of the associated value chains and, and good quality jobs that come with it. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, I wanted to turn to our final panelist, uh, Ms. Mathai. One of the things that you've talked a lot about is the role of, of women and the youth and uh, local communities in driving the energy transition in Africa. And so I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit about that. You know, how can uh, the international community support these efforts, but also what can we learn from them? Because they're really driving an energy transition in Africa that looks uh, quite exciting. Thanks, Nikos, and it's delightful to join all of you. Uh, just to start by saying so often when we talk about 
the energy transition or energy in Africa, a lot of people are still reducing this to a light bulb in a house. And that's nice, but that's not what will power Africa. And so the energy transition discussion on the African continent is about the industrialization of Africa and pulling her out of poverty. And in many ways, we're talking about building forward better because we don't have a back to build on, but we are building forward. And that, that is the, the wonderful news about this because the transition for us is, is really about taking the best of what has been done and, and just doing it right up front. And Africa is a fascinating place on, on so many levels. One, the, the average age, it's a very young continent, 19 years old. I don't know how many people know that. It's a very young continent. And so African youth are, are definitely going to be driving the agenda and the ambition of the energy transition, if not directly, certainly by proxy. And over 10 million jobless youth will pour into the job market every year. And so you can imagine the sheer scale of youth demand for jobs. And a lot of what's going on does depend on energy on the continent. 40% of ICT uh, is energy on the continent, 25% of agriculture. And I wanna spend a little time on agriculture because agriculture itself is extremely gendered on the continent. 80% of the food that's consumed in all non-industrialized countries is produced by small scale farmers. And consider the fact that 70% of small scale farmers are women. This is a huge sector with respect to energy demand and certainly with the gendered role. And then of course, agriculture with the new trade regimes coming into place, the continental free trade agreement, now opening opportunities for real uh, activating agricultural value chains in a way that could really power jobs and livelihood uh, improvement. So the opportunities here for energy to power the continent, really exciting. And then of course, 30% of education is energy. So you can just imagine all of that. But women, as well as youth, are transforming Africa's energy sector and their roles are of course uh, within the entrepreneurship, innovators, their policy and advocacy spaces. And then there's several initiatives, just even just to mention a few women in African power, you'll know that one, of course, we supported by Power Africa, and it's supporting the participation and advancement of women in Africa's energy sector. We also have Energia, a wonderful initiative that together with its partners is empowering women entrepreneurs uh, in the delivery of energy services, reaching millions of consumers in very hard to reach areas. And then of course, Women in Renewable Energy Association, Women in Energy, Kenya, there's several of these, but we know that integrating women and youth at all levels is important, but there's really some key things that we would need. A couple, I'll just mention three of those. We have to ad address education gaps. Uh, STEM education, like in many places of the world, serves as the driving force behind human capital development. And in the energy sector, this is definitely no different. We have uh, this almost similar startling exclusion of women in STEM, and we're seeing that, yes, grow, but the, the gender gap still remains. 30% um, of male students graduating from STEM and only 16% are uh, uh, women are graduating from STEM. So we need to increase uh, women in, in this sector. Of course, invest in women and youth energy entrepreneurs. There's several, it's a very encouraging space, this one, several accelerators coming up that are creating opportunities for women and youth to hone their skills, to become better at pitching, to become better at running businesses so that they can run solar and other renewable businesses. Because the off-grid solutions for energy will, will remain a major part as renewable energy is the majority of, of many African countries still rely re largely on, non -re on renewables, but a lot of those will be off-grid and that will re require a lot of these micro entrepreneurs. And then of course the policy environment has to be uh, present. And it's just wonderful to hear the secretary come talk about what's going on now and, and how that is powering jobs. National governments have to incentivize 
renewables for there to be the sort of demand that's required. So I'll stop there, Nikos. Well, thank you so much for, for these comments and particularly for bringing the world's industrialization and agriculture into the conversation as well. I think as we go to parts outside the sort of traditional OECD world and remembering the key need for energy to really power economic growth and, and, and improvement in, in living conditions. Um, uh, I'm going to turn back to Secretary Granholm. Let's do another round of questions. Um, Secretary Granholm, I wanted to ask about one particular aspect of President Biden's agenda and focus, which is environmental justice, and really the uh, search to try to not just have a transition all over the place, but really have a transition that is focused to try to address and redress historical inequities. Can you tell us a little bit about that part of the agenda and what the administration is doing? Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, some of you who have been following this know that President Biden is committed to something called EJ40, which means that 40% of the investments in environmental, in, in our environmental efforts, in our climate change efforts, 40% must be directed to the communities that have been hit hardest. And that means communities of color, um, indigenous communities. We wanna make sure that those who are on the front lines of experiencing the worst of what industrialization brings, whether their children can't breathe because of asthma or, or um, neighborhoods that have been bisected by freeways, the health pollution associated. We wanna make sure that they get the benefits of these investments as well. And I, you know, I, like all of you, I'm super impatient and, and I wanna get to the end right away. But we also know that the way we approach these investments have to determine who reaps their rewards. So, um, you know, the 40% has got to be done in a way that is consultative. If these communities are getting hurt, hit first and worst by climate change, we need to bring them to the table. I used to have, when I was governor, I had a, a body guy, somebody who went with me on all of my uh, events, and he made sure that, the, that my scheduler put into the schedule an extra 10 minutes whenever we went to an event where I was giving a speech so that I could see the people who were often unseen, like the waiters and waitresses or the security guards. And he made sure that, I, that he added that because he used to say to me, governor, you cannot lead them if you do not see them. That seeing people is so critical. I believe there's an expression in South Africa that is a greeting that says, um, saubona, and the response is sikona, saubona, um, I see you, and the response, I am here. So even though many of us are impatient, the process of how we get to the end means that we have to respect the dignity of these communities that have been hit hard, because the place-based solutions that we're talking about have to be crafted in partnership with people who have been impacted. It is an unmissable opportunity right now to get the ball rolling. In this administration, as I was saying uh, to John Hamry earlier, we have 942 days left that we are guaranteed. Our hair is on fire and we've got to do this in partnership with those who have been most affected in a negative way to make sure they reap the benefits of the structural issues that have plagued them and America for hundreds of years. Let's do this. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Granthill, for these comments. Uh, Minister Oregon, let me turn to you. I talk a little bit about the international dimensions of Canada's actions. You were co-founder of the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. Uh, tell us a little about the international priorities of the government of Canada in, in advancing the cause of a just transition. Uh, first of all, Nikos, I should mention after your comments about uh, about offshore wind, I'm, this is Newfoundland is perhaps the windiest island in the world. So that is definitely something we'll be looking at. Uh, and Ms. Mattia, I, I just wanted to uh, support your comments. If we don't work harder on diversity, on racialized communities, on, on indigenous communities, um, we will not get the most talented people that we need to do this. Uh, I hear your point loud and clear. Uh, Ms. Schuler. in the interest of transparency, by the way, I'm gonna be stealing your arguments. <laughs> Uh, yeah, those were excellent points. And I'm sure you know Hassan Youssef of the Canadian Labour Congress. I have him on speed dial because I found through all of this that the most creative solutions have 
always come from unions. Um, and let me also take a minute to, minute to say that we are very much looking forward to our American partners joining Canada and the EU at SEM. We know that we are going to be able to do great things together and we need international solidarity here. So this is a good thing. And it's in that spirit that Canada and the UK created the Powering Past Coal Alliance in 2017 for a simple reason, because coal fired power has been the single largest contributor to climate change to date. And action was and is needed on a global scale. So we wanted to speed up the growth. You know, we're impatient. Uh, Secretary Granholm said, we wanted to speed up the growth of cleaner energy sources. And the best way to do that was to phase out coal fired electricity as quickly as possible. Uh, it has become the world's leading coal phase out initiative. More than 120 governments and businesses and organizations have joined us. We wanted broad buy in because, in order for it to work, everyone needs to be on board, right? Governments, utilities, investors, labor groups civil society. Just last month, uh, Canada hosted the Alliance's first ever global summit, 80 speakers from more than 15 countries. Uh, and at that summit, the UN Secretary General called for a global effort to organize a just transition to make prosperous clean energy communities from historically or currently coal communities. Um, and the Alliance is responding to this call. Our members are leading engagements in some key transition countries in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we're sharing solutions and outcomes that we've had success with, like financial mechanisms to, uh, to accelerate coal plant retirements or um, case studies showing the economic and social benefits of phasing out coal emissions. But no government can do it alone. We know that. Um, so we're working with a lot of thought leaders and practitioners, such as uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, Carbon Tracker, the Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, as well as leading financial organizations such as Ceres, the International Investors Group on Climate Change, the UN Principles for Responsible uh, Investment. And we're working with other countries and international institutions. We've committed $275 million to the World Bank to assist a number of developing countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, with deploying renewable and energy efficient alternatives to coal. Um, we are leveraging existing international eff efforts like uh, C3E, uh, that initiative, and equal by 30 to ensure that the transition is inclusive everywhere. You know, I know, and we all know that a global just transition away from coal will not be easy. But look, working together, we have found through the Powering Past Coal Alliance, we can do this. We can do this. And I welcome everybody here to join us. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for these comments. Uh, Commissioner Simpson, let me turn back to you with a similar question. We talked in the first round of questioning about the just transition in the context of the EU, but you're also trying to engage the neighborhood beyond the uh, jurisdictional borders of the EU, whether that's the Western Balkans or Ukraine, but also more recently reaching out to Africa in partnership with the International Energy Agency. Can you talk to us a little bit about those international dimensions of the just transition agenda for the European Commission? Yes, indeed. Uh, well, um, because uh, Europe is uh, responsible for only uh, only uh, nine percent of uh, uh, global emissions, that's why encouraging and supporting the transition in our neighbourhood and worldwide is an important priority for the European Union. And uh, but what we hope is uh, that we can offer an inspiring model that uh, combines uh, ambitious climate goals with economic growth and also social fairness. And, and of course, we can share our concrete experience uh, from tools such as uh, coal regions in transition and, uh, and uh, just transition mechanism. And we can show that uh, economic and energy diversification uh, is possible and it can create better jobs. Um, so um, we will work with all our partner countries as equal partners and I'm pleased to see the growing interest in, in a just, uh, just energy transition globally. Uh, for example, um, uh, cities on both sides of the Atlantic already cooperate very successfully via the global covenant of mayors for climate and energy. And there is a lot uh, we can learn from each other. And um, you would be surprised to see how much a coal town in West Virginia and in Western Macedonia and Greece have in common. So the EU is ready to share our experience and uh, indeed um, we are doing it already. So coming closer to our neighborhood with uh, several international partners, we have launched an initiative to, to help um, coal regions in the Western Balkans and also in Ukraine. 
so that um, they can design a transition towards a carbon neutral economy and uh, already 70 regions uh, do benefit from our actions. Uh, um, of course, here, energy efficiency and renewables and uh, regional market integration um, are firmly on the agenda. And, and this is um, um, complemented um, by financial support. Uh, well, um, we want to um, reduce the risk of investments in Western Balkans, for example. Uh, we expect some 20 billion euros of additional investment flowing to the region as a result. And turning to Ukraine, this country is a member of energy community. Uh, this is a cooperation framework to support the energy sector reform and, uh, and foster market integration. And also Ukraine benefits from financial support and is participating already in our rural regions in transition initiative. So they are cooperating with uh, experts from our member states to learn from our lessons. And, uh, and, and if we look at our partners in Africa, we are engaged there in the context of um, the Sustainable Development Goal um, of Universal Access to Energy and Climate Change Mitigation. And, uh, and we are building um, an energy partnership with Africa. Um, it, it, this is a, a, a key strategic dimension of our external relations. So we have, again, several um, initiatives and together with International Energy Agency, for example, we launched an affordable and sustainable energy system for Sub-Saharan Africa program to support, for example, in particular improvements um, to the energy data management and uh, long-term energy planning. So um, there are lots of other initiatives uh, that, uh, that uh, help us to promote um, uh, our climate agenda and, and I think that uh, this is only a must that, uh, that we cooperate with our closest neighbors uh, a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Pradhan, let me ask you a similar question on the international dimensions and talk to us a little bit about how international investors, international community, uh, how can they support and how do you see them supporting India's uh, energy transition? Thank you, Nikos. Before I uh, answer your part two, let me let me put another fact of India. The rightly, Secretary Granholm raised her concern, and this is really global concern regarding this uh, global warming and climate change, and the responsibilities of entire globe. Let me put one example: how in India, Prime Minister Modi envisioned the climate concern its own way. When Prime Minister Modi took charge in 2014, around 300 million households are there in India. Out of the 300 million households, around 140 million households were linked with clean cooking fuel. Rest of the population were using conventional cooking fuels, cow dung, wood, coal, and other pollutant uh, fuels. WHO has a report 1.5 million women are dying, who are dying every year due to domestic pollution. In India, 0.5 million women were dying due to domestic pollution. Through budgetary support, through a great policy reform, Prime Minister Modi given clean cooking fuel to almost all 300 million households in India today in the, in the span of six years. In the span of six years, it's a great initiative in that way. Who are the beneficiaries? Beneficiaries are the women, beneficiaries are the children. When if there are a lot of new jobs created through this distribution mechanism, through this additional 100 million free LPG connection we have given from the budgetary support. So all these welfare scheme also are on the path of climate change and the, to achieve the sustainable development goal. And the part two of your question this is very pertinent and right. When I discussed with Secretary Granholm and later on with Excellency Kerry, the special envoy of American president who came to our country, how can we collaborate? As I said, Prime Minister Modi has a vision to fulfill our 40% requirement in our energy basket from clean energy, from green energy. And hydrogen is a priority area. Compressed biogas is a priority area. Solar is a priority area. In this area, as I said, for the next few decades, India is the growth center of energy market. Western world, developed economy has a lot of technology. 
lot of resource we have market if we can synergize in both the way in r and d area in the new technology in the digitalization you will get market for your technology and financial investment investment will be safer in a policy driven market in india i can cite one example when we took charge in 2014 we are giving in the i am in charge of transportation fuel sector in india energy sector in india we are given billions of dollar of subsidy in the transportation fuel but due to clear cut policy of prime minister modi today zero subsidy allocation is there for transportation fuel that means we have a market driven transparent system so who will come to invest in india where the clarity will be there where the decision will be there government cooperation will be there all these aspects are there in india so we have a market you have technology and there is finance we can work together and this is the area we have discussed in last few days with my counterparts at usa and uh, excellency kerry thank you mr and thank you also for talking about clean cooking fuels you know we have made tremendous progress as a world and led by india of course in electrification but sometimes clean cooking fuels lag behind and, and as you talked about the, the immense uh, health benefits that come from clean cooking fuels is 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 one of the many reasons why we can't uh, we can't lose focus on trying to advance that agenda so I really appreciate you bringing that to the conversation um mr shuler i wanted to turn to you you talked in your first uh question answer around about sort of good quality jobs i wanted to ask you about the levers that we can pull to get those jobs and and um you talked a little bit about the biden administration but maybe uh tell us a little bit what's happening at the federal level and how much of that is a state issue or a sectoral specific issue tell us a little bit about what the what are the levers that we need to pull to get the good quality jobs that that you uh described in your in your first answer yeah we are absolutely laser focused on making sure this transition and these investments have standards attached so that the talk about creating good jobs right is real and there are so many levers that we can pull um i'll just throw a couple of examples out there um you know the first example is the the lever of federal and state spending and procurement dollars to drive demand and opportunities in the places where people are hurting the most um so for example we we are looking in the US of course to converting the entire federal fleet to electric vehicles so imagine if our our government committed to procuring only clean energy and vehicles that are made by companies who meet high labor standards right and that the components in those vehicles the batteries you know are made with those good jobs requirements seems obvious right um the second example is tax breaks um you know tax breaks for renewables should be contingent on high labor standards and in fact my home state um uh Oregon is my home state my home state US senator Ron Wyden is announcing today a uh, legislation that will require labor standards for any clean energy project that uses tax credits provided by the federal government. So, um, you know, Senator Wyden worked with us. He was a great partner in getting labor rights language in the USMCA trade agreement and he's continuing that leadership uh, in this arena as well. Um And of course, you know, a, a federal lever, uh, an example of a labor standard we'd like to see in the United States is legislation that's called the Protecting the Right to Organize Act or the PRO Act, which would make the right to form a union into a real right, not just something that exists on paper, as many people don't realize it does today in the US. It takes an act of absolute heroism to form a union. Um so that's another lever that we hope to to pull um at the federal level at the state level um the states definitely have a role to play and we have a labor energy partnership between the AFL-CIO and the Energy Futures Initiative um 
and we just announced we're conducting workshops across the, the country on how to decarbonize regional economies while we preserve and create good paying union jobs because we believe it can be done and we want to show we want to have a roadmap on exactly how to do that. Um, certainly the sector specific approach again that I would highlight is offshore wind can't talk about it enough. It, that sector is showing other sectors how companies and governments and labor can actually work together. Um, and I'll just end by, by highlighting that the transition is going to require massive investment in workforce training. And a little known fact I want everyone to walk away with here is that in the United States, the labor movement is the second largest provider of training in the country behind the US military. We know how to do this. So we think um, you know, high standards for apprenticeship, apprenticeship readiness, um, that the pathway will be to these good jobs right through the labor movement. We can be the bridge. Um, and you'll have an actual career at the end of the training instead of loading up on debt and you know, having nowhere to go. So we think that a, a highly skilled, highly trained workforce is gonna be the key. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Ms. Patai, let me turn to you for the final question of this panel. And I want to turn to another of your uh, focus areas, forests and nature, uh, that you've talked about and written a lot. And I wanted to ask you, uh, tell us about the role of forests and nature, both ad addressing climate change, but also adaptation. In particular, the role that these interventions and investments can have in, 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 in empowering uh, women in particular. Thanks, Nikos, and, and I'll, I'll be brief because when we invest in nature, it's for me intuitive that we're, we're investing in our own uh, life support system. So I, I always think about it that way and securing the future for our own societies. And so it, it matters like never before. And, and it actually shows this year, if you look at the, the various conventions that are meeting, the biodiversity convention, desertification, climate change, all very heavily focused on nature and biodiversity. And so I think it's, it's very clear that we're getting a consensus globally about that. Tomorrow, a big day for climate ambition and increasing the ability of natural systems to ab absorb even more carbon than most of our economies can do through mitigation is a really important part. So there's, for me, a wonderful growing paradigm that's emerging around nature-based solutions that I love. It's produce, protect, restore, reduce. And that to me sort of spells it all. We have to produce agriculture and agricultural products better. It's the single largest emitter out there. And so, responsible for 25% of all carbon emissions. So we have to do better with our food production because we're losing biodiversity by expanding unproductively. And then we're also not, we're using too much the inputs that are driving climate change as well. So produce better, we must change the way we do that. Protect, we have to protect our standing forests, our, our tropical forests. They are by far the most important ecosystems for mitigating climate change, but also for protecting and ensuring health as we know it. COVID-19 itself, a stark reminder of what happens when the barriers between biodiversity and humans are crossed. Today, we have three huge tropical rainforests that are the most important lungs of the planet. One is in absolute trouble, the Amazon, teetering on the edge of becoming a net emitter of carbon. We ought to be very concerned. The boreal forests or the forests in Southeast Asia are already net emitters of carbon. A lot of work to be done there around mitigation and restoration. The Congo forest on my continent, even though it's under a lot of assault, remains the only healthy lung the planet has. We've got to redouble our efforts to protect that forest. So safeguarding existing forests is a really important part of how we move forward. We have to reduce waste. We have to close the food gap. We waste way too much food. And so reduce is about that. But reduce is also about the circular economy and how we can reuse a lot of 
the strategies and, and reduce the resources that we produce. And we're doing really well about that. And consumer demand for the circular economy is driving this. So this is ex extremely exciting. And finally, restore, restoring landscapes around the world to create the necessary opportunities for youth, especially to build forward better, especially in my part of the world. So let's produce, protect, restore, and reduce. Well, thank you so much. That's a wonderful note to close on. As I said in the beginning, this is a conversation that looks and feels different depending on who you talk, but it's a conversation with a common denominator. And I think the richness of the interventions we heard today speak to that. I really want to thank my fellow panelists for being on this uh, conversation. Really appreciate uh, you coming here and everyone for tuning in. The conversation continues. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Nikos.